You know, Rethink Robotics, Baxter, and now Sawyer Robots are well known as the, the robot with a face, one that has sort of a personified or had a sort of human touch to robotics. But there's a new and innovative way to program your Sawyer robot. I'm with Carl Palma, he's Senior Product Manager for Rethink Robotics. And Carl, I understand that this, of course, is the, the, the classic Sawyer robot, but there's a new and sophisticated way that you can work with this robot. Tell me about it. Yeah, correct. So, um, you know, one of the things that makes us different is that we have the best train by demonstration in the industry. You can grab the robot and you can teach it what to do. But certain times that has some limitations because if you want to do something more complex or you want to do something with vision, it's not enough. And so we've created this new software called Intera 5 that allows you to do all that more complex kind of work uh, in the same intuitive and straightforward fashion. And so for example, in this case, what I'm going to demonstrate is the vision capabilities of the robot. And we're going to demonstrate two things. One is I'm just going to dump these parts into a tray. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use the robot's vision system, which is integrated to the robot. And we're going to use that to do two things. One, re-register its frames of reference with the tray and the table. And then the other thing it's going to do is it's going to find these parts and put them in a pattern correctly. The way I do that is I've trained a lot of it in the robot, but now I can just come to the head, say restart, and the robot automatically is going to try to find this, these fiducial markers that we have here and use the technology that we call robot positioning system to be able to re-register these frames of reference so that the robot knows where to go pick the parts and where to go place them. And so right now you're going to see that. And then in the, in the background, you're going to see what's called a behavior tree. And that's essentially what's running the program right now. You can follow where the green icon is. That's exactly what the robot is doing at this particular time in, in, in space. And uh, once it finishes the re-registration process, using its vision system, it's going to pick these components and put them in a pattern. That's fantastic. So the orientation of the parts is irrelevant to the machine. It doesn't matter in this case. And the other thing that we've added is intelligence so that, for example, if it does mispick, it knows that it didn't pick the part correctly and it's going to go look for another part. So if you promise your customer that you're going to put 12 parts into a box, you're going to get 12 parts in your box. Okay, so I've seen common applications like this where a mispick creates basically a system stop. Yes. And then an alarm, and then you have to go, of course, go yes. and then potentially reset. One of the great things about behavior trees is that creating all this error handling is very, very easy and intuitive for the user. I mean, you can follow exactly what's happening in the tree right now. And if I wanted to change it, I could actually just stop the robot pull up my laptop and program whatever other additional behavior I want the robot to take. And once I'm done, I could just go back here and I have the option of either restarting the task or continuing from where I left off. So it's easy also to debug a task. And programming is on the unit's built-in screen as opposed to external laptop. You mentioned a laptop. Yes, so, so we, we can continue to train by demonstration, which means I can grab the robot and teach it a pick and a place. Yes. But if I want to do more complex things like vision, force sensing, or even patterns, I have the ability to just pull up a laptop, connect to the robot, log in its IP address on, a, on our internet browser, and then I'm, on, I'm in the robot and I can program it to do whatever I want. Can I do that remotely? Uh, yes, you can if you have a VPN, absolutely. And how to restart? In a case like this, you've interrupted the cycle. Yes. And then and to make it start again. Uh, uh, why don't you try it? All right. So you hit the rethink button. All right, the rethink button. And yes. then you get this user interface that gives you many options, one of which is run. It's run. So you press on that, yep. And then you have the ability to restart or continue. So why don't you continue? I rotate to continue. Yep. And that's it. I have no prior training in this system. The application we're looking at here is strongly suggestive of a pick and place for packaging applications yes. potentially. Uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, Pharmaceuticals, co-packing, uh, but you can also use this for example in CNC type of applications where you may dump a bunch of parts and then the robot finds them, puts them in the mill or the lathe and then triggers the machine to start. Okay. And what's, what, uh, what mass limitations are there and how heavy a part can you pick and move with typical end effect? So the robot is limited to four kilograms. Yeah. Uh, so that's really our limitation. If it's anything under that, we can pick it up and we can manipulate it. Okay. We're using a vacuum gripper now. We use a conventional two-jaw, force sensing, and any advanced end effectors. Yeah, you want to take a look? Let's dig. Okay, Carl, uh, we have a typical classic manufacturing application here. Um, uh, after final assembly, but before packaging. Uh, are all the parts present? Are the parts properly attached? Uh, is the product configured the correct way? Are valves or switches configured correctly uh, pre-packing? I understand you have got this Sawyer configured in a way to demonstrate exactly that solution on the end of an assembly line. That's correct. And, and we're also demonstrating all of our core differentiators, right? We're using vision, we're using force sensing, and we're using the ability to train a very complex task in under an hour. And so what you're going to see here is we're using our electric parallel gripper, which has the force sensing ability also. Uh, the robot is going to use its vision system to inspect certain components that you can see here. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've 
put in the system for fun is this switch. So if the switch is in the incorrect location, so if it's in the on location instead of the off location, the vision system checks for that, and if it's in the wrong location, it goes and it fixes it. And after that, it comes over here and it pulls on this cable. Now, one of the things that you'll notice is pulling this cable is rather easy. Yes. But we have the ability to control how much force we use when we pull this cable, and therefore the robot can inspect that it's connected correctly, but not take it off. Just a gentle tug, but not enough to unseat it. Correct. Okay. You want to see? Yeah. All right, let me just plug this back in. And again, uh, the way we start the robot is we go up here and we say continue, and the robot is going to continue from where it left off. Uh, you can see the robot, you can see where we are in the task in the screen behind us. So uh, you start a task like you would with, any, with, with all our robots. You go into the menu, you hit run, you hit restart. And what the robot is going to do right now is, because it's important to understand where this engine is relative to the base frame, it goes and it takes a picture of a known location and then it establishes a frame of reference for the whole pump. Once it does that, it looks for this nut, it recognizes that it's there, so we get a green light. It's going to look for that label. It recognizes that it's there. We get a green light. Now it's going to look for the switch. The switch is wrong. So we're going to get a red light, and then the robot is going to go and fix it. Now part of my logic also commands the robot to verify that it's fixed. And once it's fixed, we get the green light, and the robot carries on. Now we get the gentle tug without actually pulling the cable from the spark plug, and we see that it's been verified. Now we can trick it, and we can start making it fail. So I'll, I'll cover up the nut. No nut. We get a red light. We're going to see the label is there. We didn't flip the switch, so it should pass this time. And now once it goes and it tries to tug that cable, it'll sense that it's not actually there, and we're going to get a failure. So this is an excellent example of uh, perhaps a, a last phase quality check before yes, packaging. That's correct. And actually, a lot of our customers desire this because after an hour of inspecting the same thing over and over, people tend to make mistakes. And because our customers want to improve the quality of their products, having a robot that does that for them is a much more robust way of ensuring quality for their end users. Now, Carl, uh, one of the critical attributes of Sawyer that's much talked about, of course, is the low, low price point. Yes. Uh, it's, it's an example like this, a typical sort of, of check and small adjustment, tug, pull, uh, this gripper. A ballpark price-wise, what would a, uh, something like this cost? So once you get everything burdened, you know, you, you get the end effector, you get the robot, you get a little bit of integration, the pedestal, you're looking at an application that's going to cost you less than $50,000. Right, that's very inexpensive for the standard of uh, industrial robotics. It's very inexpensive, yes. And you, you have to understand, you, you don't have, require an expert to program the robot, so that's less money there. You don't have to build a cage, and you don't sacrifice space in your factory, which is also something that is very valuable for our customers these days. And the other benefit of this robot is because it's so easy to set up, it's great for applications where you have a high mix and a low volume type of application. Versatile, low cost, factory robotics. This is Carl Palma, Luthic Robotics.